In this lesson, we're going to learn about infinite limits and a little bit more about asymptotes. To begin, let's talk about one-sided limits. The limit from the left and the limit from the right of f of x as x approaches a are called one-sided limits. We've seen these already. We're just now defining them for certain. The way we notate them, as we've seen in the past, the limit from the left is the limit as x approaches a, and a has this superscripted negative sign, which indicates we're doing the limit from the left. So that's the we read this as the limit from the left of x approaching a of f of x, and this would be the limit from the right as x approaches a of f of x. We calculate one-sided limits in the exact same manner as we would a normal limit, but since we're only interested in one side, we only have to do one side of the limit. So for instance, if we're doing a numeric limit with a table, we only need to do the limit on the left-hand side or the limit on the right-hand side, so just one table to fill out. One-sided limits are actually much more likely to exist they rarely ever have the answer DNE, so it does not exist. The reason that we get DNE, which is this does not exist situation, is when we compare the values of two one-sided limits and they don't agree with one another, then we say that the limit does not exist. However, the individual one-sided limits usually exist, although sometimes they happen to equal positive or negative infinity. What's also nice is if you can prove that the limit itself exists, that actually implies that the limit from the left and the limit from the right both existed already and are equal to that value, which means we don't have to change how we go about using analytic methods of calculating left-handed and right-handed limits. Because if we calculate the limit itself, that implies that both the limit on the right-hand side and left-hand side also exist. Let's look at a couple of examples. Suppose I want to find the limit from the left as x approaches 2 of 2 over x plus 2. What I'm going to do is just evaluate the limit as x approaches 2, instead of just from the left, I'll, I'll just get the limit as x approaches 2, of 2 over x plus 2. The first thing that we try analytically is to plug the limit value in. If we get a real number, we're finished. So this would be 2 over 2 plus 2, which is 2 over 4, or 1 half. Now, since the limit itself exists, that implies that both the limit as x approaches 2 from the left and the limit from as x approaches 2 from the right both existed because in order for the limit itself to exist, both of these have to exist and equal, which sort of implies that the limit from the left is also one half. So that's all we need to do in evaluating these. Just treat it as a normal limit, calculate it. If it exists, we're done. Let's try the limit as x approaches 4 from the right of 4 minus x over x squared minus 16. In order to do this limit, if we plug in 4 to begin with, I would get 4 minus 4 in the numerator, 4 squared, which is 16, minus 16 in the denominator. So this would result in 0 over 0. And that's our indicator that we can probably do some sort of algebraic manipulation. So the algebra that I'm going to do is take the denominator and factor. So x squared minus 16 would factor into x minus 4 times x plus 4, which is really close to what we have in the numerator. We have a factor of 4 minus x, 
but it's not exactly x minus 4. So these won't cancel exactly as written. However, if I take the numerator and factor out a negative, that would leave me with minus 4 plus x, because factoring out a negative would change the sign on both of those terms. And now what happens is negative 4 plus x is the same thing as x minus 4, which matches this x minus 4 factor in the denominator. What I can do at this point is cancel these terms out. So this would leave me with negative 1 over x plus 4. So effectively, what I want to calculate then is the limit as x approaches 4 from the right of negative 1 over x plus 4. If I plug in 4 itself, I would get negative 1 over 4 plus 4, or negative 1 eighth. Next, we're going to do a piecewise divine function. So I want the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of my function when f of x is defined as negative x minus 3 when x is less than or equal to 2, and x minus 4 when x is greater than 2. So here's the neat thing that happens this time. So since I want values that are to the left of 2, but approaching 2, that means I'm looking for values that are less than 2. Well, this second function is only defined when x is greater than 2. So I'm really not interested for this left-handed limit in that second function at all. The only thing that's defined if I'm looking at values that are to the left of 2, which are less than 2, would be the first function. So essentially, I would be looking for the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of the function negative x minus 3. It's really no longer a piecewise defined function because I'm not looking at the right-hand side at all. If I plug in 2, I will have negative 2 minus 3, which gives me negative 5. And therefore, that's my limit value from the left. Next, I have the limit as x approaches 3 from the right of the natural log of the quantity x minus 3. Now, if you're uncertain how to work with a function algebraically, you can always resort to a table. And that's what I'm going to do here, is just begin with values of x that are uh, greater than 3, but getting closer to 3. But the thing is, I'm only interested in the right-hand side, so I only need to do one table. So I'll start with 3.1, 3.01, 3.001, and then 0001, and then see what's happening to the function itself as I approach these values. Okay, I will put the natural log of x minus 3 into my calculator in y1 and make sure my table is set up properly. All I want is the independent variable set to ask and the dependent variable set to auto. So that's great. Now we'll go to a table and I think I'll delete the stuff that's already in there just for lack of confusion and start putting in the points that I'm interested in. So 3.1 I get negative 2.3 for the function's value. 3.01, I get negative 4.6. And I'm just rounding to one decimal. No particular reason. 0, 0, 001, negative 6.9. 0, 3.0001, negative 9.2. 
Now, this function is not growing very rapidly, but it's not approaching a single number. It's not getting closer and closer to a specific value. So that's what I need for a limit to exist. So what's happening is this, these y values, they are approaching negative infinity. Not very quickly, but I'm getting really, really close to my limit point 3. And these numbers are still getting larger and larger. And it doesn't really appear like it's getting any closer to a specific number. So it's going to negative infinity. So that's my left-handed limit. I mean, that's my right-handed limit, of course. Let's start talking about some asymptotes. Uh, we have both vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes. Let's begin looking at vertical asymptotes. As a definition, a function f has a vertical asymptote at the point x equals a when the limit from the left or the right as x approaches a of that function is equal to positive or negative infinity. Now this is, this is a bit different from our definition of a vertical asymptote from algebra. That stated that a vertical asymptote occurred whenever a function resulted in division by zero. And that's still mostly true, but it just doesn't account for holes in the graph or for vertical asymptotes of logarithms. So this is a little bit more specific. So let's take a look at some examples. Let's first, let's determine where this function has a vertical asymptote. Now, when something has division by zero, that's a good indicator that we have a, an asymptote there. So in this particular case, if I put x equals 3 in, that's going to result in a vertical asymptote, or in division by 0. So that's a good indicator of an asymptote. However, it doesn't mean that there's an asymptote there. It could be a hole in the graph. The way that we would know if it was a hole in, in the graph is if it also happened to be a uh, 0 of the numerator. However, um, we can calculate limits also to find out for certain if this is a uh, vertical asymptote or not. So to save some time, I'm just going to do this graphically. So here's the graph of the function. I have x equals 3 here. And on the left-hand side of 3, so as we approach 3 from the left-hand side, the values of the function are getting rapidly smaller. So they're approaching negative infinity. So what we can say is that the limit as x approaches 3 from the left of this function is equal to negative infinity. Then if we look at values coming from the right-hand side of 3, the y values are going off to positive infinity. So what we can say here is that the limit as x approaches 3 from the right-hand side of my function, that is positive infinity. So our definition of an asymptote was that just one of these occurred. So since both sides end up being positive and negative infinity, um, that's fine. It, it still indicates that there's an asymptote. It just ha you just have to have one of the two occurring. So that shows that this is an asymptote. Now, if we, and just as a side note here, since the two limits dis well, don't agree with one another, so the limit from the left and the limit from the right do not equal. So since the limit as x approaches 3 from the left does not equal the limit as x approaches 3 from the right. Uh, the limit itself at 3 
does not exist. Now, if they happen to be going to positive infinity or negative infinity together, we could say that. We could say that it's equal to positive or negative infinity, but they don't agree. One's going to positive, one's going to negative infinity. So we say that they, the limit does not exist. Here's another example. It's very similar. Again, the point x equals 3 results in division by 0. So that is my first indicator that I might have a vertical asymptote there. But I really want to investigate the limit. So again, I'm going to do it graphically because that's a little bit faster. My limit point here is 3. And as I approach 3 from the left-hand side, the values of the function go off to positive infinity. So the limit as x approaches 3, whoops, <laughs> as x approaches 3 from the left-hand side, that is positive infinity. And then if I approach 3 from the right-hand side, the values of this function are also increasing to positive infinity. So that means the limit as x approaches 3 from the right-hand side of my function is also equal to positive infinity. Since these two are equal, we can say that the limit as x approaches 3 of this function is equal to positive infinity. It's still understood that the limit does not exist because it's infinity, but it's a little bit more descriptive to state that instead. Here's another example. The denominator is 0 when x is positive 2 or negative 2. Because if I put positive 2 in, I get 4. Because when you square, you get positive 4. When you put a negative in, negative 2 squared is a positive 4. So we get division by 0 with both of these points. Now, the problem is, one of these is actually not an asymptote. If we look at the graph, this graph only has one asymptote. And that particular asymptote is at negative 2. Positive 2 is just a hole in the graph. So the way that we know that is, analytically, if you look at the numerator, it can factor. Um, it would be x and x, 4 and 2 would multiply to 8. And if I had a positive 4 and a negative 2, that would add up to positive 2. But multiply to negative 8, great. The denominator factors into x plus 2 and x minus 2. So what happens is I have a shared factor of x minus 2, which can cancel away. So that means that this function is equal to x plus 4 over x plus 2, where x does not equal positive 2. So that where x does not equal positive 2, that's where I end up getting this hole in the graph. So if I look at the limits, Notice that at the asymptote, negative 2, when I approach from the left, I have the function decreasing to negative infinity. When I approach from the right, I have the function increasing to positive infinity. So since we have a limit that results in infinity, that is our definition of an asymptote. So that, that is an asymptote. That occurs there. But at positive 2, if I approach from the left, this is getting closer to some number. It looks like it's about 2, but maybe a little bit less than 2. But it's approaching a value um, that's not infinity. That's the important part. And from the right-hand side, it's also approaching that same value. And we could calculate that value. If I put in 
2 into my function, it would be 6 over 4, so it looks like 3 halves, so about 1.5. So it's approaching a number rather than infinity, so that means that it's not a, an asymptote. And you might be asking, how do I determine this without looking at the graph? But you, you could set up a table if you needed to. So you could set up a table to get the left-handed and right-handed limits for both of these points, and then to see that at negative 2, uh, those tables are telling you that the function is going off to infinity. And then at positive 2, they happen to be approaching a number. So the result is, however, x equals 2 gives us a hole in the graph. And x equals negative 2 gives us a vertical asymptote. One more example here. Uh, we looked at this just a moment ago as we started these slides. And we calculated this limit using a table. And what we noticed is this particular function is approaching positive infinity, or negative infinity. But regardless, it's going to infinity, so that is our definition of a vertical asymptote. But notice here with the logarithm, there's no division by zero. So having division by zero is not the requirement for a vertical asymptote. The requirement is that your function is going to positive or negative infinity which is exactly what's happening with this particular function. If you look at its graph, here's 3. As we approach 3 from the right-hand side, the values of this function are going to negative infinity. And going to negative infinity is the indicator for us that there is an asymptote here. So it's not division by 0, although that's a good indicator if you do have it. but it's, as, it's that the limit is going to infinity. All right, next up are horizontal asymptotes. Horizontal asymptote occurs in a function f when the limit as x approaches positive or negative infinity of that function evaluates to a real number. So take note here that the limit as x approaches positive or negative infinity is called a limit at infinity. And it's always done as a one-sided limit because you can't get on the right-hand side of positive infinity. There's no numbers that are larger than infinity to, a, to come that way. So it's always a limit from the left or the limit from the right, depending on if you're going to positive or negative infinity. We evaluate it by allowing the value of x to grow larger and larger or smaller and smaller if you're going to negative infinity. Usually doing things like letting x equal 10, x equal 100, 1,000, etc., so that we see it getting larger and larger and observe what's happening with our function. Let's start with a limit as x approaches infinity, 3x squared over 2x squared minus 1. Now. Uh, what I will do here is set up a table, and we'll see what this evaluates to using a table. So if I choose values of x that are getting larger and larger, so if I choose 10, 100, 1,000, and that might be enough, but we'll see. Let me get the calculator out. delete these values here, go over and put my new function in. Now, in this function, since I have a division bar, there's implied uh, parentheses around the numerator and denominator. Since there's only one term in the numerator, you don't have to have parentheses around the numerator, but if you like, and that won't hurt anything. The denominator, however, since there are two terms, have to have parentheses around that. 
All right, let's look at the table and see what happens here. So at 10, I've got 1.5, I'll just say 0, well, 0, 8 if I round properly. But in 100, it's 1.500. Zero, zero. If I put in 1,000, it is 1.5. So even though these values here are increasing all the way to positive infinity, they're getting larger and larger and larger exponentially, these values here are approaching 1.5, which is 3 halves. So the value of this limit is 3 halves. Now, uh, you don't always have to work these out using a table. We'll start with, we'll look at some analytic ways of doing this in just a moment. Um, but the thing that I want you to see here is first what this horizontal asymptote actually is. So the horizontal asymptote, oh, first off, here's our function. I've got vertical asymptotes in this function and a horizontal asymptote. So what this means is as my function, as x is allowed to go to positive infinity, these y values for the function are approaching 3 halves. Likewise, if I had allowed uh, my function to decrease in value until I got to negative infinity, well, these values here in the y, they're getting closer and closer to this horizontal asymptote at 3 halves. So the definition of the horizontal asymptote is if you let x increase without bound, if that approaches a single number, your function has a horizontal asymptote. Now, in order to evaluate these analytically, it's helpful to know the following result. The limit as x approaches positive or negative infinity of a constant divided by x raised to any integer power. Okay, And this probably does work if it's non-integer, but uh, we're going to look at it as integer values. That limit's equal to 0. So let's take a look at how this might be used. I could use a table for this, that would be fine, but here's the thing. This limit up here, that as x approaches positive or negative infinity of um, some constant over x to a power, what it tells me, well first, properties of limits, I can split this up into two separate ones. So as x approaches infinity of 8 minus the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x cubed. So the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x cubed, that's going to 0. And the limit as x approaches infinity of 8, well, that's obviously going to go to 8, because if you let x increase without bound, it's not going to change the constant value 8. So essentially, the limit here is going to be 8 minus 0, which is 8. All right, let's look at another example. The limit as x goes to infinity of 3x minus 1 over x minus 4. Here, that limit that I stated doesn't really apply quite so easily, but I can make some changes here. For instance, I could take the numerator and denominator and multiply those by 1 over x. And I'm picking that because that happens to be the degree of the denominator. And that's really how we do this if we're approaching the solution in this manner. So what would happen is I would still have a limit as x goes to infinity, but it would be 3x minus 1 divided by x all over x minus 4 divided by x. Now, there's some things I can simplify. So this is the limit as x goes to infinity. 3x over x would give me 3. Negative 1 over x would just be negative 1 over x. 
In the denominator, I have, again, I have a polynomial divided by a monomial. I have to divide every single term in the polynomial by that monomial. So x divided by x is 1. Negative 4 over x is negative 4 over x. Now I've written it in such a way that this term, negative 1 over x, as x goes to infinity, that's going to go to 0. Negative 4 over x, as x goes to infinity, that's going to go to 0. So this eventually will come to 3 over 1, which is 3. So the limit as x goes to infinity of this function is just 3. Let's look at another example. The limit as x goes to negative infinity of x minus 5 over 3x squared minus 1. Again, that limit rule that I gave you doesn't apply directly to begin with. However, I can change some things around algebraically and allow it to apply. So I'm going to multiply everything through by 1 over x squared. So this will become the limit as x goes to negative infinity. x over x squared is 1 over x. Negative 5 over x squared is just that right there. So that's what my numerator would become. The denominator, 3x squared over x squared is 3. Negative 1 over x squared is just that. So every term that looks like a fraction with a denominator of x um, having an x in it is going to go to 0. So this term goes to 0, this term goes to 0, and this term goes to 0. So the value of this limit is going to go to 0 over 3, which is 0. So this particular function would have a horizontal asymptote at 0. Um, here's another one. And this one's a little bit interesting, but uh, I want you to understand something as x goes to infinity. When it comes to x going to infinity, it really only matters your leading terms. If I'm letting x go to infinity, 5 times x is a large number. 1 is just 1. It doesn't, it kind of gets dwarfed by the value of 5x when you let x go to infinity. So you can sort of ignore the minus 1 part here. So it's not that these are equal, but this very much behaves like the limit as x goes to infinity of 5x over the square root of x squared. So even though, like I'm saying, these aren't necessarily equal, they very much behave similarly. And that's going to be true when we allow these terms go to, to go to infinity. So in general, when you're doing a limit at some point other than infinity, you obviously can't just take away terms like that. But you can sort of do that here and get a conceptual idea of what's going on when things are going to infinity. But what's nice is that right there would be the limit as x goes to infinity of 5x over x, because the square root of x squared is just x. These x's cancel leaving me with just a 5. So this limit results in 5. So even though this function isn't technically a rational function, um, I can come up with the value of this uh, relatively easily using the concepts of rational functions. But if you look at all the ones we've done so far, these are all rational functions. And you can sort of generalize what's going to happen with rational functions uh, depending on the degrees of the numerator and denominator. So if the degrees are bottom heavy, meaning that there's a higher degree in the denominator, what you'll find is that every time you do this process analytically, it will result in a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. If the degrees happen to be equal to one another, you're going to get a horizontal asymptote at the ratio 
of the leading term coefficients. Or if you happen to have a top-heavy degree, meaning that there's a higher degree in the numerator, then there's no horizontal asymptote. That limit's going to be infinity. If you continue working examples, this is what you'll find. And using these rules, you can get the value of horizontal asymptotes very quickly for rational functions. If you have a non-rational function, you do have to go through the limiting process. But for rational functions, these are very quick and easy. So for instance, the limit as x goes to infinity of x over x squared minus 5. Here, the degree is larger in the denominator. Uh, the degree of the denominator is 2, and the degree of the numerator is 1. So since the degree of the denominator is larger, it's bottom heavy. So the value of this limit would be 0, because there's a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. The limit as x goes to negative infinity of 2x over 3x minus 1. Here the degrees are equal, and so the leading term coefficients, if we take the ratio of those, that's where we're going to have a horizontal asymptote, and so therefore that's going to be the value of the limit. Now it doesn't matter that this is going to negative infinity instead of positive infinity. Um, you could think of this as negative 2 times negative infinity over 3 times negative infinity, if you like, and then the negatives cancel out. So it's not exactly how things are happening, but it ultimately doesn't matter with rational functions. The limit as x goes to infinity of x squared over the square root of x. So here, it's not a rational function because the denominator is not a polynomial. However, it's going to behave very similarly to the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared over the square root of x squared. Okay, It's going to behave similarly as we go to infinity, which means I have x squared over x because the square root of x squared is just x. Therefore, the degree is larger in the numerator. When the degree is larger in the numerator, this thing is going to infinity. So that means the limit does not exist, and therefore there would be no horizontal asymptote. Next up. The limit as x goes to infinity of 3 cosine x over x squared minus 1. Well, this function definitely isn't a rational function because I have a trigonometric function in the numerator. However, uh, 3 cosine x, if you think about the graph of cosine x, this is a, the graph of cosine x with a large amplitude. All it's going to do is just, it bounces between negative 3 and positive 3. So the numerator never goes off to infinity. But the denominator does. So what's going to happen is when you go to infinity, this function is going to follow what's going on in the denominator more so than the numerator because the denominator is growing so much faster than the denominator. And that's ultimately what we care about is how quickly these functions grow. So the denominator is growing faster than the numerator. So the limit here is going to be zero, meaning there's no horizontal asymptote. And if you don't care for that kind of an argument, you can always make a table and observe what's happening as x gets larger and larger. You will find that it is, in fact, 0. Limit as x approaches negative infinity of 4 over 2 plus e to the x. So in this particular function, I don't have polynomial pieces. Except the numerator technically is a polynomial being a constant, but um, ultimately, the function that's going to matter is e to the x. So you can 
start a table if you're unfamiliar with how this function would work out. Or if you didn't want to do a table, you could think of it graphically. So the graph of e to the x, you should recall, looks like this right here. And it has a horizontal asymptote at 0. So I'm going to negative infinity, so I'm really actually more interested in the graph of e to the negative x. Since I'm going to negative infinity, all that does is flips the graph. Again, if that's something you're unsure of, you have a very expensive piece of mathematical equipment, usually right in front of you, that can do this sort of thing for you. Graph these functions. So as x goes to negative infinity, we are approaching 0. Okay. So um, if you don't like that argument, you can also look at this as just look at the function e to the x. So as I approach negative infinity for the x, the y values here are approaching 0. That's another way of thinking of it here. So e to the x, as x goes to negative infinity, is going to 0. So ultimately, this limit is going to go to 4 over 2 plus 0, which is 4 over 2, or 2. We still didn't put a whole lot of effort into calculating that, and that's just knowing a little bit about basic graphing. Uh, of course, you can always do a table if that's what you need to do.